Hello everybody and thank you for joining today. In this episode, your host Nino shall guide you through a very different type of common list book, namely Loving Common List by Mark Watson. And the interesting part about this book is that it is in fact a sort of continuous work which Mark has been already investing years in. And what it doesn't particularly do is introduce you all that much into the basics of Lisp, which apparently the author also assumes you might pick up elsewhere, but rather it assumes that you are a well-versed programmer already, that you already know the basics of Lisp, and that you're much more interested in creating real applications and doing some real work. Which is why the introductory documentation on Lisp and the introduction, introductory explanations are not all that great. In fact, they are extremely superficial and you cannot learn Lisp from them. But they might perhaps aptly serve as reminders in case some things may have been a little bit forgotten. So what he does give you here, as I find excellent advice, is to run Lisp with RL wrap, like wrapping the read lines. That certainly is good advice, so you can use the cursor keys in order to navigate around. So this book is indeed full of such little practical advices and does not go all that much into the classical history of Lisp and, and structures and all these other things that you normally see in the beginning of Lisp books. It rather advises you how to handle your environment, how to um, get the first impression like here of local functions and, and what like Lisp generally looks like, that it operates on lists and so on. And not so much in a, as a, does not so much serve as a systematic introduction. Now, moving along forward, we are quickly plunged into, as you can see here, vectors and arrays. And now we are going to be getting into strings. As you can see, everything going quite superficially. I have picked up a couple of pages which I found interesting, so you will not see here the entire book. But the style is as you observe it. It just shows you examples of what you can be doing and does not really go all that deeply into explanations. The author himself seems to be already an accomplished programmer and for that reason he has more interest in getting you quickly through these beginner topics in order to be able to discuss with you the more interesting material later on. And Hence, with lightning speed, you arrive at something like hash table introductions and afterwards multiple, multiple value operations. Interestingly, he focuses on multiple value set queue rather than on multiple value bind, which is what I see otherwise more commonly used um, after the hash table examples. But yes, of course, that's a valid function and it it does not show you the whole breadth of multiple value functions, but it reminds you that there was such a thing and you can properly then look up some more um, in-depth catalog of Lisp functions. And as that, it works awesomely. Next, again, you're getting a little bit of practical advice, in particular relating to VI, and that you can do, let me zoom in on that, set SM in order to get pattern matching. And yeah, that certainly is some good advice. But you see, you're, you're getting here a little bit of a strange practical introduction of using a text editor in order to type list functions. You would assume that people perhaps know in general how to use a text editor and he, he assumes you know that too, but he tells you what is special when it comes to Lisp itself. So it's like, you know what you're doing, you're supposed to know what you're doing, just some pointers regarding Lisp might be necessary. And then we very quickly jump into Quick Lisp and uh, Lisp library. 
ecosystem, which is nice and much more realistic than many other introductions you will lead where the general assumption seems to be more like you will be using your own code and nothing but your own code. That's however far from how people are working in the modern world. And again, we are being plunged a little bit into defining functions. Again, this is working less through in-depth explanations and more through demonstration of how it may look like. And on it continues with a recursion. As you can see, actually a far too brief introduction to recursion. You expected to know what recursion is, but a very quick demonstration of, of how it works. And this thing of if the value is smaller than five, then do the recursion, otherwise eject. Oh, that's nice, right? Like that's sort of quite idiot safe, like count to five through recursion. And again, you get an extremely brief outline on closures, but I do believe this one is actually nice. Like while this is short, I think you picked it really nicely. So there you can see like how you can define one and further below, you can see how, how it can be used. So if you already know a little bit your way around Lisp and just need to be reminded things, this brief outline is actually more useful than getting some chapter of 20 pages on closures and not being anymore quite sure what you need from it and what not and just like, you know, skipping around. Same goes for macros, though I think the macro part might even be too short. But for a reminder purposes, <laughs> it might just be serving well enough. Then come loops and here you're introduced to do list. Uh, it's up here, here on the top part of the screen, right? And then you're getting to see do times and only finally the rather complex do form itself. What I always find a bit of a pity is when one focuses all that much on them instead of just really going for a loop and return, which is what, frankly, I'm a big fan of. But putting do list and do times first is perhaps more sensible than starting with do, because do is just simply too powerful. It offers way too much flexibility. When you see it, it feels like getting struck in the face. Whereas do list and do times due to being more reduced are more beginner friendly. This is then followed further by uh, file input and output examples. There, the, um, like you, you do get to see here how you can do that. Like, right, like that you're having here um, the direction input thing and the with open file form and, and how you can be using up here Oops, ha, huh, where did we get? Okay, let's scroll forward. So that you can use here the do times example, let me zoom in a bit on it, in order to uh, read a file, all right? And similarly, you get a very nice example for outputting things to a file, so one can say practically oriented, briefly showing everything that is needed and that you in particular as a developer likely will need. Then we're getting an interesting detour into plotting. Now, that may not be something we need every day all the time, but plotting has its uses in particular if you if you're interested in certain documentations, perhaps, and into showing some graphical elements in some well-documented way without getting way too fancy with some graphical user interface. So I find that actually quite nice. Then comes an, a chapter on um, object-oriented programming. I must say I'm not that much of a fan of it, neither of the chapter nor of uh, object-oriented programming in general, but maybe that's just me, maybe you will like it more, so I refrain from saying how it is, I just say not my most favorite part of the book. The next part, though, is actually fun, 
you're plunged straight, you're just pushed into heuristically guided search and straight into a variant of the A-star algorithm. An implementation is shown, of course, he's showing everywhere the code for all things he's doing. So, so you know, if you need code examples, this is what your what this book may really give you. And one may say heuristically guided search is the nowadays only a relevant kind of search. You know, our computers have become so fast that where we are playing with toy problems, where we're playing with things with a couple of thousands of possibilities, we do not even need to bother anymore with who knows what systematic search, we can just go through everything in some way and handle things. And the moment things become more interesting, these things become so exponentially more cumbersome that we need to resort to heuristics. So it's either do it straight or do it heuristically. You don't need to even much have worry about this in-between area nowadays, like just at least my personal opinion. So it's nice that he just didn't fumble much around with everything else, but just showed you, look, this is the thing you will likely most care about. Then we're having an introduction to all sorts of topics. All sorts of practical topics and while this book is going towards 300 pages and we're still at not even 100, the primitive Lisp introduction, like, like what simple things there are to expect, ends here. And from now on start the advanced topics, which are the true forte of this book. So now you're getting a little bit practical examples of network programming, which are then further channeled into doing internet search, but not only, you are in fact being shown also how to do certain, uh, like directed towards doing things like certain NLP tasks, like here you have it, general language understanding, detecting key phrases and entity names, translating between languages, converting between speech and text and so on and so forth. So. These are the typical tasks you need to do nowadays rather than just simply, oh my god, I found a chain of characters, right? So, so it's nice that he actually quickly orientates you into that direction. Now, of course, finding things leads to cataloging things, and cataloging things truly leads to using relational databases. And my dear viewer Weld, you asked me about any Lisp book treating database access. Well, here you go. I hope you enjoy that. <laughs> so that might be your most practical approach in that direction. Now, after databases have been handled, you are shown how to handle certain NLP tasks, you know, like you're having it up front here. Let me make that a bit larger. So part of speech tagging, similarity of documents, categorization and summarization of text, determining sentiment. And then you're having this basically this entity recognition, like detecting names of places, people, products and whatnot. So these are very practical, relevant, and everywhere used nowadays NLP tasks. And it's really nice to see such examples chosen. Then on it goes towards web spiders. Can't comment much because I never quite that much cared about um, spidering across the web, but of course it is a relevant by task. It is a relevant side task if you want to collect data in particular for feeding machine learning systems. So that is included too. It's really batteries included. Then you're going towards <laughs> machine learning with some common list machine learning library. And then you guess it, we arrive at perhaps the most uh, relevant task in nowadays machine learning advances, neural networks. But just let me show you one thing. This, this advice for SBCL, how to increase the dynamic space size, like the heap size. Oh gosh, I totally advise you to do that. Like I have been stumbling across this problem all the time and I find it great that he mentions it because 
once you run out of it, you need to Google and whatnot. And he's just straight telling you, look, if you're working with a lot of data, this just might happen. Then comes pages and pages on backpropagation, as I already mentioned. This is, of course, nice because this is industrially very important. And from the uh, neural network approaches, this is perhaps the most well-known one. It might also be mentioned while neural networks seem to be the stars in the media and um, in, in like popular sentiment, it should not be forgotten that in a real industrial applications, neural networks are just one instrument out of many and frankly due to their black box nature, like you, you see that the weights are changed, but you cannot say that you intellectually quite so well understand that. You can research experimentally what changes what, but neural networks are just still rather opaque and also quite resource hungry. They are not always the first tool of choice. So one should not be blinded by the hype and there are a lot of other uh, approaches rather than neural networks and I do encourage you to, to simply you know look beyond and, and have further interest into other topics as well in particular decision forests and things like that. Uh, I'm also a big big fan of feedback learning. Now I mean backpropagation neural networks are captivating nowadays the industry but personally I'm a much bigger fan of hop field networks and they are treated nearly nowhere and they are treated here which is in my opinion just great this is awesome i love that and of course you're thinking yeah but isn't there some other language nowadays quite popular for approaching uh, machine learning issues one that is itself not fast but that is having so many libraries python yes but he does show you how to use a library in order to embed Python in common Lisp. So that's great to, to have it here covered as well. And then, I mean, I'm just making here a large jump into a very big chapter. He is going towards knowledge graphs. Now, knowledge graphs I find very important, in particular also in the area of explainable AI and in showing and demonstrating solutions to which a machine has arrived. Like if you can show a whole cluster of terms pointing to a certain direction, if you can show a whole set of relationships going somewhere very, very closely in, in large amounts, then you get a much more intuitive understanding as to what a machine is doing. So I find it great that he treats that topic as well. And then finally he goes towards something which yeah, here's another part on that, um, which I don't find all that great, namely using Lispworks KP or KPI or whatever you call this UI toolkit. Now we all know that Lispworks exists and you can do user interfaces in Lispworks, but I don't like that status in general. I mean, this is one of my main critiques on common Lisp it should go towards some sort of standardized library for designing graphical user interfaces. I mean, it's ironic that some of the first machines which had anything like a graphical user interface were Lisp machines, and that nowadays the status of graphical user interfaces on Lisp is so very splintered and everybody does his own thing in the basement. It would be nice to return to it uh, and I don't exactly advocate using any specific commercial product even if it is a good one as Lispworks one doubtlessly is. And then come, comes the stuff you're certainly asking yourself, will this be mentioned or not? Oh yes, Mark mentions it, namely using OpenAI APIs. So he certainly does devote the end of the book to GPT and ChatGPT, also ChatGPT3, but I'm sure that he will in, uh, in time update things to, to ChatGPT4 too. And how you can be uh, doing this more modern large language model uh, processing in Lisp is certainly a topic here in. What I also should mention is, 
Uh, by the time this video has been made, Mark has released a new version of this book. Mine is of April 23, but in May 23 he already updated the book again. And now he has included a part on prompt engineering. So I certainly encourage you to get this book from his website because you will then continue to get updates of his book. He just sends them by email. You need to do absolutely nothing than download a PDF you get on your email. And there is always some interesting stuff added. So yeah, that's a great book and I'm very happy I got it. It's not a good Lisp introduction. It is a very interesting starting point for exploring um, Lisp more deeply and with regard to more modern and practical applications. And yes, finally, he also mentions using common Lisp with Wolfram 1. And that's pretty much how this book is ending. As you see, we're at page 293 in this version, though, uh, <laughs> I mean, this book just keeps getting longer and longer, right? So that's the wrap up. Uh, I am very grateful for, for him having written such a thing. It is a modern work on Lisp, which cannot teach you the depths of everything because it would have to be then thousands of pages long rather than 300. But it is very great to have it around. I'm very happy about it. I hope you enjoy today's review and I hope to greet you here soon again. Until then, I wish you a wonderful time and from me, goodbye.